Hey, welcome to What is Philosophy Part 2. In this video, I'm going to review a little bit the definition of philosophy we gave in Part 1. Then I'm going to talk about a working definition of wisdom that's going to be based on a conception of knowledge, so I'm going to have to go into that a little bit. And then lastly, I'm going to give a few examples that attempt to illustrate wisdom. So let's get the party started. What is philosophy part two? Love it when someone has a PowerPoint and they just read from it, which I'll probably do a little bit of. Philosophy, we talked about philosophy and characterized it in terms of its disciplines. Hopefully this is review and hopefully it all sounds a little familiar. There were four main disciplines classically that philosophy has been broken down into. There are a million subspecialties and subdisciplines, but the four big ones are epistemology, which was the philosophy of knowledge. Philosophers are studying what do we know and how do we know it? What counts as justification for our beliefs? What do we mean when we say something's true? How do we figure out whether it's true or not? What are the criteria that really count and make sure that we say, hey, that's really adequate justification. We know that that's true. We are certain of these things. Do we care about certainty? All things epistemology cares about. So any of those questions about knowing something and if we know it are going to be kind of epistemological questions. Second discipline, logic. Logic is that philosophy which attempts to provide us objective criteria by which we can say one set of reasons for a belief are better than another set of reasons for a belief. They can say, hey, that conclusion you have follows from the reasons you gave for it. And this one objectively doesn't. You don't have a good reason for this belief. You do have a good reason for that one. Logic's going to be super important no matter what philosophical endeavor you're undertaking because it's been a kind of primary tool in the Western world for the last 2,000 years. Metaphysics. It's kind of the incredibly shrink, incredible shrinking discipline in philosophy in a lot of ways because a lot of metaphysical questions, questions about philosophy of reality and existence, are starting to or have been answered by physics. So as questions of metaphysics begin to be answered by science, they become in the realm of physics. Metaphysics is that philosophy of what's real, how does it exist, where does existence come from, what is the fabric of the universe and what makes it up. What is time? What is the stuff of the world? What are physical objects? All of those questions are really, really interesting metaphysical questions. Um, and in just about every discipline, you have to contend with it because everything's going to have to somehow tie back to the real world. And even if you're talking about something like in philosophy of mind, you might be talking about awareness. Well, what's the metaphysical What's the metaphysical status of a mind? Does it exist, exist somewhere? What's it made of? Those are the sorts of questions that metaphysics will ask. Axiology, philosophy of value. Traditionally, we think of it in ter terms of two uh, flavors. You have aesthetics, which is the study of beauty, the value of beauty, the beautiful, not just pretty, but what sorts of things really move us and why do they? What is the, the value in a sunset or a walk in the woods? What's the value of someone who's really physically beautiful? What's the value of a beautiful painting? Those sorts of questions. And then moral value. What are the values we're talking about that we want to create or preserve and protect when we say, oh, don't do that. That's the wrong thing to do. Or that we're trying to cultivate or bring more of into the world when we're saying, ah, that's the right thing. Do it. What is it that makes the right thing to do valuable and the wrong thing to do not? So, epistemology, logic, metaphysics, and axiology. Almost always when people talk about axiology, they end up, or theories of value, they end up wanting to talk about ethics. Now, on to the stuff that is going to be a little more nitty gritty and we're going to work with more often. And I'm going to return to it over and over and over again because it's a reminder of kind of the way I want you to think of philosophy and what we're going to be trying to do. And part of what we're going to be trying to do, we can illustrate by examining the etymology of the term philosophy. Philos, Sophia, love of wisdom. So, Philosophy, in philosophy, we're lovers of wisdom. We're trying to cultivate wisdom. So what we need to do 
is figure out what wisdom is. And the definition I want us to uh, think about is going to come from a reading that I've given to you that you can uh, gives an example of wisdom. So if you've already read the McKeon Barter, keep it in mind. If you haven't, keep this in mind when you read it. First off, when we think of wisdom, there's a handful of characteris characteristics that we can be pretty certain of. The one characteristic of wisdom that just about everybody agrees with is that it's a sort of knowledge. You cannot have a chunk of wisdom that isn't a chunk of knowledge. That's something that 99.999% of epistemologists of wisdom, which you now know what those would be, people who are studying knowledge and specialize or focus on wisdom, they'd all say, hey, every case of wisdom is a case of knowledge. It's hard to be wise about something that you don't know. So it's likely going to be a sort of knowledge, and we'll talk about that in a minute. We also have all these characterizations that each and every time I ask a class to think about, hey, what do you think of when you think of wisdom? This list is going to come up or some version of it. We don't think of young people. We think it has something to do with age. It has to do with practical experience. It's practical knowledge that's useful in the world. It often includes problem solving or overcoming obstacles or problems. All of those things are really, really true in a lot of cases and help us understand wisdom. But I want us to focus on a particular conception because I think it's super duper helpful. And if McKee and Barber are right, it accommodates all of those criteria. Every single one of these and any other thing on your list of what wisdom is, it will account for. And that definition is overcoming tempting but false or poorly justified beliefs, overcoming illusions. What we're going to be focused on with regard to characterizing philosophy and what we're going to do in philosophy is to use the tools we have, tools that logic is going to provide us, tools that will demand that we think critically, tools that will make us look for the best evidence and best reasons all the time in order to overcome tempting but false or tempting but poorly justified beliefs, overcoming the illusion of something. And hopefully the next like 10 to 15 minutes will help explain what that is. In order to do that though, first thing we're going to do, talk about knowledge. So this would be a great place if you wanted to take a break, hit the pause button, have a drink of water. Here, look, I'll do it with you. Or a drink of coffee, go to the bathroom, maybe update your Instagram story, and then we'll soldier on knowledge. A lot of people use the term knowledge or they know something in a whole bunch of different ways. In philosophy, like everything else, and as we already talked about, we have kind of a particular vernacular. And we have a particular conception of knowledge in mind that almost everybody in philosophy universally agrees is at least the starting point of what knowledge consists of. And so we are going to start with that definition. Not everybody believes it's a complete definition, but it's a great starting point and it'll be consistent with just about every definition people give of knowledge. And that is the classic tripartite definition, classic, classical, because it comes from Greece. Most people attribute it to Plato of JTB. Remember, JTB stands for justification, truth, and belief. Whoa, or hopefully belief. Belief is the easiest one to explain because we all have beliefs. What it means to believe something is to hold it as your own and to believe it to be true. So you hold it to be true. Some people will say it's a <clears throat> propositional attitude in that a proposition is a statement. Just think of it as a statement for now. We'll go more into it in greater depth elsewhere. But it's a statement that's either true or false. So let's say the statement is, I have a water bottle on my desk. I do, by the way. I'm putting, I just drank from it. I'm putting it back down. I believe that. And what that really means is I hold the statement 
there's a water bottle on the table, to be true. I believe it means I think it's true. I believe it means that if you asked me, hey, Chad, do you think there's a water bottle on the table? And I were to answer honestly, I'd say, yeah, absolutely. So some people will make it, if you're into psychology, it would be a non-cognitivist account, sort of account, is that there's an emotional aspect to this, possibly, of I have a feeling about the statement such that it's thumbs up. More importantly for us, we're going to say, if it, we believe it, we hold it to be true. We believe it to be true. So it's something we assent to or something we hold. Assent to means I would agree with it or accept it. What does it mean, though, to have justification for a belief? That's going to be where it gets trickier. Justification and truth are the pain in the ass of knowledge. Beliefs, everybody understands what they are. Everybody has them. What distinguishes between the beliefs that we have that are just beliefs and those that are knowledge? One of the components historically philosophers have focused on is justification. What is justification? Justification are the evidence and reasons that give you the right to believe something. So they're reasons and evidence. Reason, what evidence do I have that this bottle's on my table? I see it. I can touch it. I can lift it to my mouth, drink from it. Hey, look, that was wet and watery. So I believe it to be a bottle full of water. What evidence do you have? I'm showing it to you. You assume I'm at a desk. Could I be lying? Yeah, but it seems like you have pretty good evidence. More often than not, when people are talking about evidence, they're talking about that kind of empirical evidence. Empirical evidence is evidence that we get through our senses, the kind of ultimate means by which we come to know things through our senses is science. That's what science is based on. You have to have physical, empirical evidence for something to count as science. Reasons might not rely on evidence. I'll give all sorts of examples. I'll give the sort of example I'll return to. If I tell you, if all wikis are wonky and you have a wiki, do you have a wonky? If all, so each and every single wiki is wonky. You have one wiki. Oh, hell yeah. You have something wonky. I just made those th things up. I didn't just make them up. I've been using those for probably 20 years. Um, and I think they might have come from someone else, but I don't know where. The wiki did. I don't think the wonky did. Uh, if we think of those things, those are good reasons to believe the statement. If there's a wiki, if every time there's a wiki, there's a wonky, and you have a wiki, then you have a wonky. We also just looked at a really great argument form in logic. That's the sort of argument form that works perfectly. It would be a valid argument. Um, if A, then B, A, therefore B. Those are reasons. And they didn't rely on any physical evidence necessarily. So if it were an epistemology class, we might go into greater detail about how do we distinguish between what's empirical evidence, what's not, what's kind of rational, justified evidence, what's not. But for us, for now, we just really want to focus on good reasons and good evidence for our beliefs, excuse me, reasons and evidence that gives a person the right to believe something. What does it mean to have the right to believe it? The best way I want, and the reason I borrow this from famous philosopher of the last century, century, century middle of the last century actually, um, is because I want you to think about it outside of your own personal experience, your own subjective experience. If justification is good, it means that anybody who's capable of seeing and hearing and feeling and touching and tasting this water bottle and drinking from it. If my evidence is good for believing that the bottle's on the table, then anybody should who had that same evidence should believe the same thing. It should give them the right to believe and say, hey, I know that I have good reasons and good evidence to believe that the bottle's on the table. So, one thing we're really going to push on and focus on is recognizing that that reasons are ours doesn't make them any good. That beliefs are ours doesn't make them any good. Beliefs are good if they're good because they're justified in ways that at least everybody should be able to say, if I had those experiences, if I had that evidence, if I had those reasons, 
hell yeah, I should believe that to be the case. Now the last one that's the trickiest for people, oftentimes the trickiest for people, not necessarily for everybody, is truth. One of the things that makes it super tricky is that we use the term true in a whole bunch of different ways. And again, we're going to have some specific conventional definitions for truth and truth value in philosophy that are a little different than the way people use the terms all the time. But before I get into truth, I have to drink some water before I die. I'm not going to die. Seriously, that was maybe someone's like calling 911. This video, by the time you see it, by the way, is old, so uh, you wouldn't have helped me anyways. All right, hydrate or dehydrate. You know that. Not really. It's pretty hard to really dehydrate to the point that you would die. So no need to worry. I'm fine. Truth. <clears throat> it's one of the components. It's the, a really important one with regard to having knowledge. We have to have a belief. The belief has to be justified, but the belief also has to be true. I can't have knowledge without truth. And there's a whole bunch of examples that people will give as to how and why that's the case. I may be justified in believing something and have, out, have justification for it that a whole bunch of people would accept, but it still might not be true. We could all just be mistaken. So if I really know something, I need it to be true. Given this account, it's impossible to know something that's false. It's also impossible to know something that's not adequately justified such that it gives everybody the right to believe it. So we're going to focus on a particular conception of truth that's spectacularly conventional that almost all of you already believe in, but I do want to recognize that it is not the only conception of truth out there. If you are interested in competing or other conceptions of truth, let me know. I'm really into it. I would love to talk about uh, pragmatic conceptions of truth or uh, disquotational theory of truth or uh, correspondence theory of truth, coherence theories of truth, pragmatic theories of truth that are rely on a correspondence theory of justification, any of that stuff. If you're into it, reach out to me because I will send you in the direction of cool readings and or we can talk about it or email about it or whatever else. But the most kind of conventional account of truth, which is consistent with 99% of the way everybody talks about truth and almost all theories of truth, even different or competing ones, will include some elements of a correspondence theory of truth, are that something is true if it meets the truth criteria. The truth criteria, in the, in, um, according to a correspondence theory, <clears throat> are that a statement has the truth value of being true when they are the case. They are false when they are not the case. So the statement, there's a water bottle on Chad's table, is true if and only if there is actually a water bottle on the table. The statement, Chad has a blue Expo marker in his right hand, is true. What makes it true, the truth maker for the statement. Statements are things that are true. Propositions are things that are true. We have written out the statement. Chad has a blue Expo marker in his right hand. It doesn't even have to be that specific. Chad has a marker in his hand. We say that statement's true, capital T, true, if and only if it is the case that Chad has a marker in his hand. That's what makes it true. So, True statements are true because they map onto the world, because they line up, because they are the case. False statements are false because they don't. That's a really, really important concept to wrap your head around, especially because we use the word truth in a bunch of different ways. It's why sometimes I'll challenge people to think more deeply when they say, ah, that's my truth. Well, if it's true, then it's every, it's true for everybody. It might specifically, what you're saying might specifically be talking about your experience of the world. But if it's true, let me give you something that might be very specific to me. I can see an old yellow post-it note tucked under my computer screen right now. 
That is my experience. Chad is having the experience of a yellow post-it note that's tucked under his computer screen right now. Now that is true or false based on whether I'm having that experience. That it's my experience and that I'm the only one who has the justification or experience or evidence for it doesn't make it just uniquely mine because everybody could say Chad's having that experience. So I'm throwing that out there as a challenge because a lot of people want to think of truth as being wholly subjective. And that's something I'm going to push a bunch on. We're trying to characterize possible criteria for truth to be objective. And that warrants its own video, so that'll happen. Consistency, the last part of the slide, is really something that I want to plant a little seed in your head for when we're going to talk more about logic, is <clears throat> a consistent collection of propositions or statements will be one that doesn't include any contradictions. And the reason I bring that up is if a collection of statements includes contradictions, we're going to need to look and figure out which one is false. Just saying that much, think about it, have it rattle around in there. Maybe like, what the hell is he talking about? If a collection of, or state or collection of propositions or statements includes contradictions, we have to figure out which one, if not all of them, are false. We'll leave it there. Think about it. What the hell is he talking about? We'll figure it out. So truth. We're working with a correspondence theory, kind of a simple conception of truth as a statement's true if it maps onto the world. Whether that's the real physical world, Chad has a marker in his hand, or a world of ideas in some way. A unicorn has one horn. By definition, I mean, I guess it would be a duocorn, I don't know, <laughs> double corn. So, justified, true, belief. Beliefs are things we hold and assent to being true. Justification are the adequate reasons and evidence we have to believe. <clears throat> Truth means that it actually is the case. It maps onto the world. Wisdom, then, is a chunk of knowledge that, if we return to our definition, is a case of something that's justified, something that's true. It's obviously a belief we hold that is overcoming attempting but wrong belief or overcoming attempting but poorly justified belief or seeing through the illusion, seeing through the temptation. I'm going to give you a couple examples and leave you with an example that you can find in the reading. First, I use this example quite a bit, but having a broken heart, especially for the first time, and I'll even make my head big. When someone gets their heart broken for the first time, this isn't the case for everybody, but a lot of you will relate to this. There's this idea that, oh my God, I will never love again. I can't love again. This was my one true love. This is so horrible. This is the worst thing that ever happened to me. <clears throat> and after a bad breakup, if you were to go to that person, especially if they're like 13 to 18, possibly, and say, hey, look, here's the deal. Everybody gets their heart broken. Don't worry about it. There's more fish in the sea, those sorts of things. Are they going to be like, oh, yeah, you're right. Thanks. I really appreciate it. No, they are not. They're going to say, no, that's not true. This is different for me. You're like, well, I mean, I have my heart broken. Then I fell in love. And now I have a much better relationship. That's because your relationship wasn't real love. It wasn't the true love that I shared with so-and-so fill in the blank. Everybody feels that way when they get their heart broken for the first time, if they really get their heart broken, or some version of it. And we can see that that's totally illusory. It's an illusion. It's a temptation. But the person really believes it. It's the same thing that motivates, and we can talk about this all day long. I hope someone remembers this and brings it up. Why it's so crazy and ridiculous that people celebrate getting revenge on an ex or something, getting revenge on someone who cheated on them. You're hurt and you're angry, so you want to hurt them too. But that's kind of really, really super childish and insane. Hurting them doesn't really make you feel better. It doesn't really benefit you. The right answer, 
one of the right answers and morally justifiable answers, which will be a great philosophy to talk about, would be, oh, I'm su super glad I found out they cheated on me. So now I can not have a relationship with them if having a monogamous committed relationship is important to me. Awesome. They made their choice. Bye. I wish them the best. Hope they never see me again. I'm never going to date them again. But all of those things don't happen. That totally rational, sane, responsible response to getting your heart broken never happens because what's tempting us, it hurts so damn bad. The emotions are so strong, right? You want to throw all of his shit out the window and light it on fire. That's not a sane, rational, reasonable, thoughtful, or healthy way to deal with having your heart broken. But in the moment, it feels like it is rejecting the possibility of ever loving again. No, you don't understand. Our love was so deep. No one could ever really understand it. Really? Eight billion people in the world. You don't think anybody's had a relationship that's remotely similar to the one you had. When we get our hearts broken, when we're really feeling things, one of the super powerful things that can overcome our ability to see adequate justification and truth, emotion comes into play. And it's one of those cases where all of us, if you've had your heart broken and look back at it, you're like, oh my God, I hated him so badly. I wanted to slash his tires. I was doing all, I like wanted revenge. I was certain I'd never love again. All of those things, which really don't make a lot of sense. If we look at the evidence of the world, we all believe them momentarily, at least. So looking back, we can realize that the knowledge that, hey, it's entirely possible to overcome a broken heart. It's entirely possible to bounce back from a bad relationship. It's entirely possible to move on and find a deeper, greater, more rewarding, more spectacular love than the one that you had. All of those things are absolutely true, and I know them to be true. But they're kind of wisdom because they're hard as hell to accept when your heart's broken and in the moment. Now, let's get to example two, which is a real favorite of mine, which has to do with craftspeople throwing pots. I use this example because in a super famous dialogue of Plato's, the Apology, Socrates goes out trying to prove his buddy Caraphon had uh, gone to the Oracle at Delphi and she told him that Socrates was the wisest guy and Socrates ends up being, um, as some of you have probably taken a history class and, or a Western Civ class and know the story is, Socrates is charged with corrupting the youth and impiety toward the gods, which really doesn't make a lot of sense. He was probably just being uh, arrested and persecuted for being a pain in the ass and annoying the hell out of rich, influential people by uh, distracting their sons from the education they were supposed to get. But that's like just a brief little aside. If you want the apology, I'll probably just post a copy of it so you can read it. I'm happy to discuss it with people outside of class. Um, again, another topic to email me about. But he, though, there are two places he really attributes wisdom to in the Apology. One is, and wisdom proper. Depending on the translation, there will be different versions of the word wisdom, but oftentimes um, they're conflating different words in Greek and just making them all the same sort of wisdom. But like there's techne, which is technical wisdom or technical knowledge. Sophia, which is the sort of wisdom we're talking about, etc. So you can imagine how they got translated into the into one word in certain translation. But wisdom, he attributes to two people. To himself, and the only part he attributes to himself, the only chunk of wisdom he claims to have is, he says, I know that which I do not know. A degree of humility, like understanding, I don't know a lot. I'm not certain of anything. I'm trying to explore this stuff. And then he attributes a degree of wisdom to craftspeople. And I think the greatest demonstration or illustration of that, because I once upon a time took a bunch of pottery classes and threw a bunch of pots. Throwing a pot is how you make what you is referred to if you build a pot on a wheel, on a potter's wheel, right? Like it's spinning around. And that whole process is such a perfect analogy for wisdom because your first class 
demands that you confront the fact that, oh my, I was tempted by an illusion and I'm going to try to push that illusion as far as I can and realize, oh wow, it takes a bunch of experience, knowledge, understanding to overcome that illusion. So see if you can identify where the chunk of wisdom is here. Because in your first pottery class, if you've done this, this is going to resonate with you. Like your pottery teacher comes in and she like rolls up her sleeves and has like ripped forearms and takes a giant hunk of clay and throws it down right in the middle of the potter's wheel. And she says, first, you would have had to wedge the clay to get the air bubbles out and all of that. And you're going to fail at that anyways, too. You're going to make a mug or something that explodes in the kiln because there was an air bubble in it. That happens. But she wedges all the air bubbles out, works this ball, giant ball of clay, and slams it down into the middle of the wheel and says, the first task you're going to have when you're trying to make a pot is to center the ball of clay. And she has this giant ball of clay and the wheel's spinning and she just grabs it and using the centrifugal force and the spinnery and the force from her hands, she takes this wobbly thing and just pushes it gently and all of a sudden it's perfectly still. It's just spinning perfectly in the middle. She's like, okay, once you get it centered, that's the first necessary step to make a good pot. And you're like, oh my God, this is so easy. How cool is this? It's sort of like one of those little spinny paint things where you made beautiful art with no skill at all. You're like, this is going to be a piece of cake. Now it's perfectly centered. It's spinning. And she slowly opens up the middle. She's like, hey, you're going to open it up a little bit. Then you're going to stretch it out to the side to widen it. And then if you want to make a higher pot in order to get the height and elevation, you're going to with equal pressure on your fingers, gently pull the pot upwards little bits at a time. She does this a few times and now she has this perfect cylinder. It's like a foot tall. You are stoked because you wanted to make some art today and you are damn sure you can do that. So then she stands up. She has to stand up because it's so tall. Reaches down. She's like, to shape it, you want to put a little bit of pressure, more pressure on the inside than the outside if you want to stretch it out. If you want to go back in, a little more pressure on the inside. Careful while you're pulling it up in order to keep all of the thickness of the walls even. And then she makes a basic vase, takes out her string, cuts it off, and is like, there, that's what it takes to make a pot. And you are so stoked because you've always wanted to be an artist. You weren't very good at any of them. I'm talking about myself. And you're like, this is the dopest shit ever. It's going to be a piece of cake. So... You go for a giant volleyball piece of clay and she's like, uh, maybe you should start with something a little smaller. And she gives you like a piece that's like the size of a tennis ball. You throw it down and you're like, all right, let's go. She wedged it for you so it's not going to blow up. And you go like this and you're trying to center it. And you're trying to center it. And now your hands are getting hot because there's like sand in there. So you get some water from your sponge and you put it right on there. And now it's starting to turn into mud, but you can't center it. But you want to make a pot. So you... Just go for it. It can't matter that much. Looks pretty easy. So you're going to start to open up your pot, even though it's wobbly and not centered. And that's going to lead to uh, making it impossible to have even pressure. So you're like tearing it a little bit. You fix it with a little bit of spit. You pull it up. You're like taking a piece off and sticking it back on the side. You're trying to make it work. It's going to hell in a hand basket or hell in a pot. <laughs> but you keep soldiering on because you want to make some art. So you start to pull it up. You pull it up and inevitably you push too hard with one of your fingers and you like just tear the top off. But that's okay. You're going to smooth out the top. You try again, fail again. Now you've got like a puddle of mud and some dry spots and it looks like you kind of carved it and it collapsed, but you wanted to make some art. So you cut it off and you're proud of your ashtray that you made. You don't smoke. You don't know anybody who smokes. But you wanted to make something, so you had an ashtray. How the hell is that an analogy for wisdom? Well, I think that's the sort of wisdom Socrates was identifying when he saw the craftspeople. They have this really practical, hard-earned skill through experience that overcomes the illusion and temptation to believe that making crafts or making pots is really easy. But there's a ton of skill involved in doing it. And when you see someone do it who's really skilled at something, it makes you feel like it's going to be easy until you give it a try, and then you realize it's hard. But if we think about our 
ideas and really good ideas, well-justified ideas as that pot, that's what a hell of a lot of people do. They're so excited to get that pot, to make that piece of art. They just chop off whatever ashtray they have and say, these are my beliefs. These are well-earned and justified and I have good reason for them. When really, they just are satisfying the person's desire. If you go on the interwebs and you go to the Reddit message board or Facebook posts or comment sections of Yahoo or Google News or wherever you go, you're going to see a whole lot of people advertising ideas as if they're really, really good ideas that they really crafted and they spent years perfecting and honing their skill at building. They're acting with the confidence as if they've given all of that to make their pot when really they just have an ashtray. And people with ashtrays will go around patting each other on the back. Oh my God, your ashtray's brilliant. So is yours. Oh, that idea is so good. I totally agree with it. Let me ignore everybody who disagrees with me. Because there's something tempting about being right. There's something tempting about accomplishing something. There's something tempting about the emotions and the satisfaction that go along with that that make it really easy to fall into the trap of thinking we know stuff we don't know. So... Those are two examples that I think kind of illustrate um, our conception of wisdom. And the third is one from the reading. Sorry, I just skipped through that. Which is about buttons and pennies, buttons and coins. And it comes from a super famous developmental psychologist, psychologist in general, Piaget. And so some of you, if you've taken an early childhood education class, may know who he is or may be familiar with this experiment. But it's another example that illustrates wisdom. So to review, philosophy, we had the four branches. The working definition we have is philosophy as love of wisdom. We're pursuing wisdom. What's wisdom? A type of knowledge. What's knowledge? Justified true belief. So what is, makes wisdom a certain special type of knowledge? Overcoming tempting but wrong beliefs. Two examples of knowledge, of wisdom, sorry. I'll give you more examples of, than that of knowledge. Our primary example illustrating knowledge was of the water bottle on the table. Primary examples of wisdom were, one, we have the example of gaining the wisdom through experience that even if something hurts really bad, like having a broken heart, you can overcome it and learn and move on. That's a chunk of wisdom people will talk about. We have the wisdom to know through our experiences that we will love again. And we realize, given our definition of wisdom, why it's so tempting to feel in that moment, no, I won't, I'll never love again, because you're hurting so bad. The second example I gave was about pottery, because Socrates attributes wisdom to the craftspeople in that we can see they have this hard-earned skill that's practical and developed and overcomes the tempting but illusory belief, the tempting but poorly justified belief that, hey, anybody can make a pot. It looks easy. Therefore, we can too. Similarly, it serves as an analogy for poorly formed beliefs, poorly justified beliefs, and those are the ones we're going to overcome. Oftentimes, it's our emotions. It's our desires. It's our personal experiences. It's what we want to believe. It's how we were raised. All of those things provide temptations, and philosophy is going to give us some reasons, some tools, some criteria to try to overcome those temptations. Thanks for watching. Have an awesome day. And you will see me again probably pretty soon.